you to take your Bibles if you have them or if you have access to a copy of the scriptures and join me in the New Testament, the New Testament book of Philippians. Uh, We began last week a series in this letter that the Apostle Paul wrote. He wrote it to a group of Christians living in the city of Philippi, but by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he also wrote this book, wrote this letter to us, the message, the words uh, that he gave to the Philippians so long ago still speak as God's voice to us uh, today. And so I'm going to pick up in Philippians chapter 1, verse 27, and I'm going to read through verse 11 of chapter 2. So Philippians 1, verse 27. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and, how, and now hear that I still have. So if there, there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full of cord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, help us now to trust that these are your words to us, that you are actively speaking through the scriptures and by your spirit even now. Help us to listen. Help us to humble ourselves. Open our eyes and our ears, our minds and our hearts to receive what you're saying this morning and to be changed by it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I was reading recently about new trends in restaurant design. So for example, there's a restaurant in Manhattan that is now placing a beautifully made box beside every plate on the table. And that box is an invitation to take your phone and put it in the box for the duration of the meal so that you can pay attention to the people who are at the table with you. There's a restaurant in Pittsburgh that serves food only from places around the world where there is current armed conflict. It is a way to bring awareness and to advocate for peace. Uh, There's a trend that has come from the Netherlands called Einmal, which means one meal. And the idea is to design restaurants so that it's okay to eat by yourself, to take away the stigma of dining alone. What's interesting to me about all of these trends is that they are less about food and more about relationships, which food and relationships have always been connected, but in these trends you see a sense in our culture of understanding, of perceiving that something is off, something is broken in our relational world. And of course, that concern isn't something new. That isn't a modern trend. We see that concern in this old letter that Paul wrote to the Christian church in Philippi. One of the most repeated words in this letter is the Greek word koinonia. It's often translated fellowship 
are partnership. It is a deeply relational word. And so Paul writes to the Philippian believers to celebrate his partnership with them in the mission of the gospel. And he writes to them to celebrate their fellowship, their community, their relationships with one another. But as he writes in celebration, he also acknowledges a concern. He acknowledges that there are threats, external and internal, to their fellowship, to their partnership. And so he urges them, and he urges us as the Christian church here in Columbus, Ohio, to continue to pursue koinonia, to continue to pursue deep partnership, fellowship, lasting unity. You can hear that in the phrases in our text as he tells us to stand firm in one mind and one spirit, to have the same mind and the same love. But how does that happen? How does that happen when all we hear is polarization? How does that happen when it seems that all we see is families, churches, and other communities splintered? How does it happen when we feel our own deep loneliness and isolation? How in the face of all of this relational brokenness can we have koinonia? Deep partnership, fellowship, lasting unity. Well, I want us to bring that question uh, to this part of Paul's letter in Philippians 1 and 2, and we'll find that Paul doesn't give us a box for our phones or food from around the world or a table for one. Instead, he gives us two relational strategies. He shows us that to have this deep fellowship, we have to look high and we have to look low. So first of all, we have to look high. Before Paul tells us that he wants, to, wants us to have one mind and one spirit, he tells us in chapter 1, verse 27, that he wants us to live worthy in a manner worthy of the gospel. Now that translation softens the language. This is political language. This is the language of citizenship. What Paul is saying is that he wants us to live as citizens of the gospel. And what does that mean? Well, I think it's helpful to know a little bit of the background of the city where Paul sent this letter. Philippi was in Macedonia. It had been founded by Philip, the father of Alexander the Great, but it had also been overrun, conquered by the Roman Empire. But there were two things that made Philippi unique among other places conquered by the Roman Empire. First, it was heavily populated by former Roman soldiers, military veterans. And second, unlike most of the places in the Roman Empire, the residents of Philippi were granted the full privilege of Roman citizenship. They weren't just subjects, they were citizens. And the strategy was this, the political strategy of Rome in doing this with the city of Philippi was to create a pocket of allegiance in a region that was not always happy about Roman rule. They were creating an outpost of loyalty, not just begrudging submission, but loyal celebration of Caesar as Lord. So you see what Paul is doing? As he speaks to these Philippian believers who understood the power of citizenship. He is saying, you have a better citizenship. I want you to live out of a deeper and more significant citizenship. You see, the church is a colony of allegiance. The church is an outpost of loyalty. He says, I want you to be citizens of the what? Of the gospel. And what is the gospel? It is the announcement and the celebration that Jesus is Lord. 
that through his life, death, and resurrection, he has conquered the powers of sin, Satan, and death, and has ascended, ascended to the heavenly throne, a throne that far exceeds and will far outlast the throne of Rome and the throne of any nation or any empire. At the end of our text in chapter 2, verses 10 and 11, Paul quotes from the prophet Isaiah, the Old Testament prophet Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 45. And in that chapter, God is speaking, and he speaks to the ends of the earth. And he says, all of creation, all of the earth will be gathered, will be unified as every knee bows and every tongue swears allegiance to me. So Paul is expanding Isaiah, and he is saying there will be a day, there will be a moment when all of creation will be unified. All of creation will be gathered in the acknowledgement that Jesus is the revelation of that God speaking in Isaiah, that he is the revelation of God's majesty and power and glory. And so all of creation will be unified in the acknowledgement of him as Lord. The church is an outpost of that future. We are the beginning of that unity. We are the beginning of all of creation celebrating the lordship of God revealed in Jesus. We are a colony of joyful allegiance not begrudging, but celebratory loyalty to Jesus as our Lord above all else, above all others. That is what creates and sustains our koinonia. That is what will gather us and that is what will keep us together. It's like putting a magnet on a table full of metal objects. When you put a magnet on a table full of metal objects, everything reorganizes and gathers around that magnetic center. And it is Jesus and the announcement and the celebration of him that must be our magnetic center, Walnut Creek. Will we let Jesus and the announcement about him and the celebration of him be our magnetic center. Will we be the anticipation of that future? Or will we reflect the fragmentation of our present? Will we give ourselves to lesser loyalties that in the end will drive us apart? Throughout the Advent season, we lit the Advent candles and we had scripture read in languages other than English. And that was a moving and a beautiful reminder of this reality. That the church is not a community of shared cultural, national, ethnic, or any other human affinity. The church is a community of shared adoration. The adoration of the one to whom every knee will bow and every tongue and every language will confess that he is Lord. Is that what we will continue to be in a world of polarization, Walnut Creek? A community gathered and sustained by shared adoration, not cultural affinity. But that's not enough. It is good, it is necessary, it is very important for us to admire Jesus, but it is not enough for us merely to admire Jesus. In order to have this deep and lasting unity and fellowship, we must not only look high to our exalted Lord, we must also look low. In chapter 2, verse 2, Paul tells us that he wants us to have the same mind. What does that mean? 
Well, he shows us, he shows us that mind in chapter two, verse five. It is the mind of Jesus. But what does that mean? Well, it doesn't mean just thinking ideas and concepts, which is what we hear when we hear the word mind. No, notice how Paul goes on beginning in verse six and the rest of the passage in to show us the mind of Jesus. And when he shows us the mind of Jesus, it is not primarily ideas about Jesus. It is the motion of Jesus. It is the movement of Jesus. And though he fully belonged to the majesty, the splendor, the privilege, the status, the honor of heaven, of the heavenly throne room, because he is the eternal son of the father, fully divine, he did not cling to that, but opened his hand and emptied himself, which does not mean that he emptied himself of divinity. He did not cease to be God, but rather that he set aside the visible splendor, status, honor of heaven so that he can join himself to the mess of being human. And not just humanity in general, but to the lowly status of a servant, of a slave, a person who ident whose identity is the agenda of another but not just a lowly slave, not just a lowly status. Jesus also joined himself to a specific obedience, an obedience that led him to death on a cross, that led him to rejection instead of status, that led him to shame instead of honor, that led him to a horrific death instead of the comfort comforting privilege of heaven. That is the mind of Jesus. That is his motion. His mind is that movement down, a movement that results in an even greater revelation of what it means for him to be the Lord, an even greater revelation of how he rules and reigns, an even greater revelation of his identity, of his name, the nature and the character of the glory of God. It's the logic of a trampoline. The way up is the way down. You gotta go down before you go up. That is the motion and that is the mind of Jesus. And for us to have the mind of Christ, it is not just to think those truths about him. It is not just to confess and speak or even celebrate those truths about him. To have the mind of Christ, we have to join him on the trampoline. We have to join him in that motion, willing to set aside status and preference and comfort and our own reputation in order to pursue God's good plan for another. To have the mind of Jesus is to see others in the way that Christ has seen us. It is to perceive our relational world, not as Easton, not as a mall where we get what we want. It is to perceive our relational world, not as a football field, where we strive to win, to show that we're better, to assert our dominance. No, it is to see our relational world as a dance floor, as the opportunity to join in this movement together. But how does that happen? I don't think there is anything more opposite of our natural tendency, of our natural motion than this movement. And so how does this movement happen? Well, the answer to that is in the giant word, if, in chapter two, verse one. If there is any encouragement in Christ, comfort from love, participation in the spirit, affection and sympathy. That if 
is why Jesus humbled himself and became obedient even to the point of death. He did that in order to bring all of those benefits, all of those gifts into our lives. And the if produces the then. The if is what makes the movement, what makes the motion possible. That's what makes it possible for us to join Jesus in this movement. It is by bringing in all that he has given to us. It is by receiving the fullness of what he gives to us that it is from that fullness that we are then able to empty ourselves in the pursuit of the good of others. You see, we cannot work up this kind of humility. We can't grunt our way to this life of service. We have to receive our way there. It is out of receiving all that Christ has done and given to us that then we can give ourselves to others. That word participation in verse 1, it's our old friend koinonia. So do you see it? It is our, our fellowship with one another will come only from our fellowship with God's very presence given to us through what Jesus has done because he humbled himself and became obedient even to the point of death. Our lasting unity with one another will come only from living out of our union with Christ that Hayden taught us about last week. It is only as we breathe in the encouragement, comfort, love, affection, and sympathy given to us in Christ that we can then breathe out service to others. He is the music that makes the dance possible. I read about another recent trend in restaurant design. You know, typically restaurants are set up as front of the house and back of the house, dining room, kitchens. But res restaurants are experimenting with breaking down the barrier between front of the house and back of the house. There's a restaurant in Brooklyn where that barrier doesn't exist at all. Your table is directly beside, and you can directly interact with the people preparing your meal. And that is what Jesus has done. By becoming obedient even to the point of death, Jesus has prepared a meal that will reconcile all things to God. And when we believe in him, when we live by faith in him, he brings that meal into our lives. But he doesn't only bring the meal, he brings the kitchen as well. He feeds you at the table, but then he also puts you at the stove. So that in the midst of all of the relational brokenness around us, all of the conflict, all of the loneliness and isolation, if we will walk by faith, if we will live by faith in Jesus, he not only feeds us, but he makes us a table of welcome. He makes us a table of intimacy and belonging. He makes us a table of deep and lasting fellowship. And so Walnut Creek, let's not only look high to our exalted Lord and celebrate him together, but let's also look low to our incarnate Lord who has given himself for us. And by giving himself for us, he's made it possible for us to give ourselves to others. Let's pray. Father, you have revealed to us your glory in your son, and he is beautiful. And we celebrate him, and we adore him, and we, we become an anticipation of that future, and we confess him as Lord. Father, help us to continue to do that. Help us to be willing to humble ourselves and set aside our own claim to sovereignty and celebrate his sovereignty over our lives, over our community. 
But Father, not only have you revealed your beauty in, in Jesus, but you have given us that beauty. By faith in your spirit, you have joined us to him so that we can join in his movement of humble service. Help us this morning to breathe in the comfort, the encouragement, the affection and sympathy and love that is ours. Fill us, Father, so that we can empty ourselves this week into the relationships that you've put around us. We pray that Walnut Creek would be an expression of what we've seen from your word this morning. Would you make us a people who are willing to join that dance of humble service to one another and delighted celebration of our Lord? We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand? We're going to respond to this passage with a couple of questions from the Westminster Catechism that tell us about the humiliation, the humbleness, the humility of Jesus, and also his exaltation. It's the movement that Paul describes in Philippians 2. And I want to remind you, as we proclaim our faith, these are not just ideas to think. This is a motion to live. And so would you join me as we affirm our faith together? I'll ask the question and you'll join me in the answer. How did Christ humble himself? Christ humbled himself in that he was born in a low condition, made under the law, undergoing the miseries of this life, the wrath of God, and the cursed death on the cross, in being buried and continuing under the power of death for a time. How was Christ exalted? Christ was exalted in his rising again from the dead on the third day in ascending up into heaven in sitting at the right hand of God the Father Almighty and in coming to judge the world at the last day. Let's sing together.